So I'm totally alone here. I don't see anyone, but good morning. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all safe and well. I don't see myself here, so I assume see or anybody else that I'm online. So my name is Lara. I'm an urbanist and I work independently for Urbart and UIA. And I welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Oh, here we are, all of us. So thank you for, for joining us so numerous. Uh, this is the first event of a one year um, events uh, about housing, about adequate housing. And when we prepared this talk, we prepared it before the pandemic. So we thought of before of Zoom mania that we now have, we thought of having this kind of discussion a long time ago. And we thought, well, maybe we will have like 50 or maybe 60 people. And we are very surprised and delighted to know that we almost reached 500. So that uh, tells us uh, that, um, that people want to know more about solution and want to know more and that um, adequate housing is a fundamental question. And today, I mean, because of the pandemic, I think it's not only fundamental, but it's a burning question especially thinking that uh, like uh, recently beginning of april oxfam published a report saying that um half billion of people are predicted to be in poverty and we know that more people are rough sleeping and there are many uh, struggling to pay rent and mortgage while we know that big corporations are bailout so this is a time where uh, we need the efforts of everyone to work around the topic of adequate housing so what we do today, um, we, we plan to work um, and to share ideas and experiences around non-speculative forms of tenure and the forms that see land and housing as a common good. So we will look at different uh, experiments and practices around the concept of uh, collaborative, self-built, a social production of habitat, you name it, through case studies of two European programs, uh, Urbacht and uh, Urban Innovative Action. And these are programs uh, dealing with um, sharing of knowledge, capacity building, implementation, or two different typologies of um, programs. And they cover more or less about 500 cities. And this is the first time that they work together. And we would do that with. Uh, all these speakers that you see that come from a different background and are not necessarily involved with these programs so they are from activists uh, they are activists they are researchers they are practitioners and you will see them and uh, listen to them in a minute so as i was saying at the beginning as you probably know from the website this event is part of a series of uh, events that we call knowledge hub uh, around housing and it's in line with the UN campaign um, right to adequate housing also in line with the work done with, by the EU urban agenda partnerships but also it's very much in line with the many policy demands for fair housing that social movements around the world are uh, campaigning for as well as other international organizations also joining us like housing Europe are also campaigning for so we do that because uh, we believe that the the university the, the the rights are not monolithic and also we believe that uh, fundamental challenges and fundamental changes are necessary to the existing system uh, economic system that sees housing as a cash machine and so we think that uh, the voices of everyone from different sectors need to be mobilized and so that's why we are particularly glad that we have these opportunities of opening up the doors and Urbart and UIA also provided the opportunity to have different voices um, getting together. We're very thankful to the speakers that also voluntarily decided to join us. And in particular, I want to thank uh, personally all the team from Urbart and UIA, um, particularly Amélie Cousin, Alice Fauvel, Ophélie Tanguy, Raphael Barbata, and Nola Morgan that provided the opportunity to be with us together. So I don't want to take more time to introduce uh, the, the topics, but to say that why don't we focus exactly specific on housing and COVID? I mean, people have been asking, why don't you change the whole program? And so we said, well, for two reasons. The first reason is because we hope that there will be within the 
planning of these two programs, um, activities that deal specifically with the, the emergency of housing and, 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 and the virus, but also we think that uh, this kind of self-training training that we do um, and sharing of information are fundamental are an emergency housing adequate housing is an emergency with or without the virus and um, and so we will talk in the future about eviction uh, eviction restraints rent control ordinances fair finance and more which are more topics that are part of long list of policy demands um, let's give more time as much as possible to all the speakers and to you uh, we cannot see you and we cannot talk with all of you that are participating in the in the chat but you have an opportunity to uh, write question and questions in the uh, in the option that you have you should have on top of your screen uh, you can have the option to chat to the organizers uh, if you have any technical troubles. Please write your chat while we are listening to the speakers because then we will have a moment with uh, Levente Poliak, who is an expert of Orbach in UIA, uh, that will help us to, um, to collect all these questions and also to, um, to, to give the specific moment uh, where you see in the agenda the question, uh, question and answer uh, that comes to all of you that are um, participating. The other point is that we have uh, um, um, Twitter and we encourage you to tweet uh, through uh, UIA and Urbank uh, uh, and then with the hashtag right to housing. And I think we should start now and I use my time available and would like to give the floor to the next speaker. So we'll start with the first case on community land trust uh, from the city of Brussels. Um, they have, um, um, they gained support from this project called Calico from the UIA and it's part of uh, large experiments and uh, programs that are uh, the community land trust Brussels. Uh, and um, Arthur Caddy is going to tell us about it. So Arthur, is, uh, we're listening to you. Thanks. Good morning, Laura. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? Yes. Okay. So um, hello. Nice to know that uh, 500 people are looking at me right now on their computers. It's a bit uh, um, scary. Uh, I'll start the presentation. I don't know if uh, Amelie, could you show the, the slides or uh, Alice? Um, I was asked to, to talk for 15 minutes about uh, the community interest of Brussels and the project Calico. Um, they're both pretty complicated uh, endeavors, I'd say, so I'll try to focus on some concepts that might be interesting for the participants here. Um, I'd like to start on the community interest of Brussels, so it's the first of its kind in continental Europe. And uh, the reasons why it was uh, put together are that it's a very interesting uh, option to secure social housing in uh, urbanly tense cities. Let's um, look at, I'll just read out the four main reasons why it might be uh, interesting to uh, create a community and trust in a city that is in need of more affordable housing. So the CLTs, they protect land and housing from real estate speculation. They make permanently affordable housing for lower income households. They're a much more cost efficient alternative to other social housing models and they give citizens a chance to claim back their own cities. So in the next few slides, I will go more in depth about uh, these different concepts. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is a, um, a, uh, it, it's a drawing that tries to show really what it is that the core concept of the community land trust. Um, the idea is that uh, the community land trust acquires a land, puts it in a trust, builds a building on the land, and sells the building, the housing units, to future inhabitants, but keeps the land in a trust. What does this create? Meaning that the land is taken away from um, real estate speculation, whereas the buildings are sold with a clause that means that they will always be sold at social housing price, at, at affordable prices. And um, the, the, the slides will be available for download if you need more time to regather what's uh, put on the drawing, but Basically, what makes it interesting uh, as a solution for uh, affordable housing is that, first of all, it's 
one investment, meaning that uh, public, sir, I mean, public subsidies go into buying the land and building the house, and then there is no need for public money anymore. Um, in usual affordable uh, home ownership uh, schemes, the public subsidies have to complete the price that people pay to uh, buy the homes if they rent to rent the homes. Whereas in the case of a community land trust, the public money goes into buying the land, building the house, and then that's it. The rest is covered by the sale and resale of the homes, which will always be at a capped price. Um, and also an option for cities is to uh, bring land without spending any money if they have available land within uh, their uh, um, within their ownership, they can immediately provide it for the community land trust to build affordable housing on it. Uh, the main difficulty, of course, in this case, is always getting land. As you know, uh, places like Paris have become infamous for having uh, a square meter that can be sold at 10,000 euros. Um, so I would guess this is the main challenge. Can we get to the next slide, please? Uh, when I was saying that a citizen can claim back uh, the, the city with the community land trust model, the one of also of the main ideologies in the community land trust model is to bring a governance system that includes citizens with public powers and with civil society. At the community land trust of Brussels, a third of our administrative council is composed of representatives of public powers, a third of inhabitants, and a third of representatives of civil society, associations usually active in access to housing and right to housing, and uh, people, neighbors of the project. So not inhabitants, but uh, citizens. Uh, next slide, please. So at the community land trust, uh, it is, we, we try to involve communities. We cannot claim it is uh, community-led since uh, we uh, try to include communities, I mean, people who have little means and sometimes a lot of our uh, target groups are first-generation immigrants. People didn't grow up in Belgium, so we don't have the means, the financial means, and sometimes the, let's say, the cultural capital to bring together collaborative housing projects. So what we try is still to include our target groups in the different steps of uh, putting together the housing which they will inhabit later. On the picture, for example, you can see what we call an archilab, which is uh, an occasion for future inhabitants of the projects who have already been selected to move in the future housing to give their take on the architectural proposals and to uh, make choices in the designs of the future homes. This is a very important aspect for us because we think it's part of giving back the cities to the community that actually inhabit them rather than real estate speculators. Um, it's not just selecting uh, how the building will be put together, but we also uh, teach them in co-ownership, uh, train them into managing a co-ownership with uh, everything that it implies. We also try to create uh, community spaces that local associations will be able to use. And overall, uh, we try to really make land available at an affordable price for local initiatives. And uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so <laughs> I'm project manager for Calico, which is an UIA uh, funded uh, project. It's a very innovative experimental project with a lot of different aspects. Uh, what you see here are the logos that are of the different partners who are part of Calico. So I'll present them very quickly. Uh, Angela D, the first one, is a feminist organization. They help women in precarious housing situation and try to raise awareness in gender-based discrimination in access to housing. The Brussels capital region, Brussels Housing, is the main urban authority for the Calico project. Eva, uh, Eva Brussels is uh, putting together a system of mutual care um, and uh, health management within the housing cluster. Next uh, on the second row, starting from the left is Passage, which is an organization that is creating an intergenerational housing cluster within Calico and is putting together a facility for birth and end of life in a familiar environment. It's also a very innovative concepts uh, that will require 
a whole conference on its own, uh, but um, right now I don't really have that time. Then perspective that Brussels is an agency of uh, the Brussels region capital that brings data and information on uh, the urban sociology of Brussels, let's say, and the urban situation. And the VUB, the Free University of Brussels, is doing a study on the project, which will be available uh, when the project is done in October 2021. Right now, Calico, uh, well, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, if you can, Amélie, can we move to the next slide? OK, so there are slides missing. I think there's a bit of an issue here. Um, this the next slide should be one with uh, that shows the links for the the video clip we created for Calico that explains the project very very clearly and very precisely in a few minutes. So I don't know why it's uh, not showing right now. I hope uh, all is fine on the technical side. Um, to continue on Calico, the project was started on November 2018. The building is currently in construction. Of course, with the lockdown, a lot of things have been uh, put on hold and the construction has slowed down. Um, the, the slides will be made available for download normally. So on the next slide, you should see links for YouTube videos that explain the Calico project uh, more in depth. And uh, I suggest you go on the UIA web page of Calico if you want to. to I will, I will uh, put it now. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so I see already a lot of interesting uh, questions uh, on the community and trust model. It's usually. Uh, uh, regarding the resale mechanism, but um, yeah, so Calico should be, uh, the inhabitants should move in a year from now if everything goes well. Right now, with the lockdown, it's not going very well, so we're more looking at the uh, date of next summer, but all the inhabitants have been chosen and we're, right now we're not, but usually we do group forming activities with them uh, because Calico is a community -led trust project that actually tries to involve inhabitants a lot more in uh, this housing project. We still don't see the, the, the slides. Is everything all right? <clears throat> okay, I'll move on to the next point I wanted to make up. Ah, something's happening. For months, Joanna had been dreaming of finding a dwelling for herself, her little girl Munia, and her son Sammy. Yes, it's hard for a single woman with two children to find decent housing in a city like Brussels. But thanks to the Calico co-housing project, she has just moved into a good quality and affordable flat. Since then, Joanna has dropped by to say hello to Marcel every Saturday. At the age of 84, the Calico project has been a turning point for him. Being cared for at home, he can enjoy a rich social life and give some of his time to his neighbours. Like everybody in the neighborhood who wishes to, when the time comes, he will be welcomed in the end of life facility by Pass Ages, a partner organization that supports people at the end of their life, as well as future parents in welcoming their baby. Here, every moment of life is shared and generations come together. And indeed, this evening, neighbors have met up in the common area to share a meal organized by Maria and Ibrahim. This is where they talk and dream together. At last, there is an innovative formula that interacts with the neighborhood and meets the expectations of everyone. Thanks to the CLTB, it is possible to buy or rent a dwelling without speculation on land managed as a common good. Here, there is a place for everyone. The gender balance is encouraged by Angela D, a feminist organization that supports vulnerable or isolated women. Calico is a 34 housing units project in Forest. It came about thanks to the impulse of Brussels housing and the combined energies of all partners involved. Calico is a different way of living together. Care and living in community. With the support of Urban Innovative Actions. 
Thank you very much, Amélie. Thanks for the, the clip. I actually didn't think we would be able to see it, so that's uh, that's that's great. Just to add to some elements missing from the, the video, uh, there are also two housing units for people at risk of homelessness that will be put in the that will be part of the project and will also be integrated in the whole care uh, project with something we're working on. It's quite complex, but we're very excited about it. I see I have four minutes left, so that should be fine. Um, and on that also, it, the, the video mentions that there will be some rental units. This is something quite uh, innovative for us also. It's something we haven't done before. The fact is that we still sell homes. So when people are past a certain age, let's say 50, it's still hard even to get a social mortgage to buy the homes. So to, in order to try to reach all the people, we try to put together um, social housing on the CLTB land. Uh, can we go back to the slides? It should be slide seven. Is that possible? Is it's just to it's the one with the interreg um, logo. Yeah, the, just before that one. Yes. Thank you. So um, interreg is a um, ERDF funded, uh, no, it's a lots of fun. It's a European fund that man that finances um, projects in northwestern Europe. We, as the CRTB, work on a project called SHIC, so Sustainable Housing for Inclusive Cities and Communities, I think. And uh, the idea is to um, disseminate the community land trust model across Europe. It's a partnership between the CRTB, the city of Lille in northern France, and the national CLT network in 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 um, England. If I'm not mistaken um and uh yeah it's been going on since uh, 2017 and if we go to the next slide it's the just a quick overview of uh how many clts were supported or developed with uh support like organizational help or vouchers uh within europe um as you can see in france there are now the organisme foncier solidaire which were developed under the, the previous government and uh, which are being promoted also through the Chic project. In Belgium, there's already quite a few, and we're establishing one in Berlin, one in Amsterdam, and hopefully it will create a greater movement for the community land trust model um, to be supported as an excellent housing solution. Uh, thank you. I think that's already a lot. Um. Can I, can I, am I on? Do you hear me? Yes, I think you, you should hear me now. Um, so thank you very much, Arthur, for the explanation. It's very hard to talk when you don't have anybody else uh, <laughs> like showing and doing like nodding. Listening uh, to I was me. afraid of making any jokes because I had no idea whether people would laugh <laughs> or would be ashamed. Exactly. So I, it's very it's yeah. very weird for me as well so we are experiment i've never done this before <laughs> uh so anyway um thank you very much for explaining in such a short time all the the projects and i, I know that there are people writing many questions and we will come back together with uh, with the, all the questions so i would like to give the floor to the next speaker the next speaker is uh, dr michael lafont uh, i know michael from berlin uh, from uh, activist gathering from meetings from uh, different types of encounters and michael is a an activist a researcher and a practitioner and somebody that works at the intersection of uh, common good and collective ownership in berlin on many different uh, topics and he has been publishing about co-housing and so is also part of a group of uh, other friends and activists working uh, on community land trust in Berlin. So in the list that Arthur showed at the end was uh, one first experiment in Germany, and this is happening now in Berlin. And so we asked uh, Michael to tell us a little bit about his work and about the, the first uh, CLT in Berlin. So thank you um, also, Michael, for, for participating. And we will take you in back uh, after when we go to the question and answer thanks okay yeah good morning everybody once again thank you laura for the nice introduction and uh thank you everybody with uia and urbac for uh 
inviting me to reflect for a few minutes and uh, share something of a short story from Berlin. So if we could go to my presentation, then uh, we'll jump right into it. So you see the title, Co-Production and Common in Co-Housing and Community Land Trust. Uh, part of my reflections are uh, encouraging us to see the connections between the housing initiatives, uh, if the cooperatives, co-housing, uh, or whatever we call them, and community land trust at the structural level. But I would also like to make the connection to the urban planning level. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. To the next one. <laughs> Good. Um, so as Laura said, I've, I've been in Berlin for the last 30 years and uh, for the last 20 years been working with the Institute for Creative Sustainability. Two of our main projects on the left, the uh, Co-Housing Berlin uh, database we've been managing with other partners for the last 10 years, networking, publicizing, supporting what we call co-housing for this region and doing publications. So the Co-Housing Inclusive is the most recent uh, and most popular one, focusing on the uh, necessity to open up cooperative and co-housing uh, and consider how it can be more inclusive. So let's go to the next slide. What is co-housing? Uh, that's a bit of our discussion today. We have some diff different terms here, collaborative housing, community-led. I, I tend to work with co-housing as an umbrella term. And when I say that, I emphasize these three points. It should be self-organized. This means a strong degree of participation, something like a direct democracy. Community-led, uh, it doesn't always have to be this, but this is a trademark of co-housing. And uh, if it's done well, uh, it's connected to the uh, sustainability crisis as well and helping us with our challenges of regeneration. Okay, next. Why co-housing? What are the motivations? Mobilizing people and resources, uh, especially when neither the government nor the private market housing developers are developing adequate uh, and affordable housing. Uh, supporting innovations is definitely a trademark of co-housing. Uh, this means uh, not just being innovative to be funny and creative, but helping our, uh, our cities and our local housing markets to learn. Rebuilding local communities uh, in times of crisis or after the crisis uh, and the time of Corona, there's a lot of isolation. Uh, so even more uh, during and after this, uh, we need to support community. Reducing loneliness uh, in cities like Berlin and other larger European cities, one of the, the problems of, of our time. And of course, developing and maintaining affordable housing. So the project that uh, I've been working with for the last 10 years or so, I live and work here, Spreyfeld in Berlin. It's, uh, it's one of the last and one of the most famous of Berlin self-organized community-led uh, co-housing projects. This kind of a project is not possible anymore in the inner city. We have to emphasize this point. Berlin was something of a playground between the early 90s or even the late 80s and until about the year 2015. Um, this kind of a, uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, this kind of a project, uh, famous not just for giving people a relatively affordable place to live uh, with a local democracy, but also giving people places to work, places to meet, places for the neighborhood, gardens, and so on. Uh, and trying to be sustainable at the same time. To the next slide. So just a, a quick run through our recent history in Berlin. Between 1990 and 2015, the rough estimate is that somewhere around 500 co-housing projects were developed and realized. This is quite a range of projects, including squats, uh, this kind of a co-housing where I'm in but also many other uh, varieties on this, uh, including many non-speculative uh, and affordable housing uh, examples. In the last few years, as I've said, since 2016, there's been virtually no access to land and property 
for anybody that's coming from the lower middle class and not even the middle class. So what this means for myself and, and uh, increasing numbers of people and initiatives in this city, similar to many other European cities, we are working on strengthening cooperations between civil society and local government and uh, with our networks and uh, our, our lobbying, uh, working to change real estate policy, to change rental policy, to change housing policy, and to support more democratic and local community ownership strategies. So going on to the next slide. Um, this brings us to the Community Land Trust in Berlin. In German, it's called the Stadt Boden Stiftung. Uh, I think Laura mentioned this at the beginning. It's the first uh, community land trust uh, model for Germany. Uh, we've been working on this for the last two years or more. Uh, it's emerging as a cooperation between local government and civil society. And uh, from my perspective and the perspective of many, to uh, create opportunities for the present time and the future for people to be involved in producing and managing their own housing. Not necessarily community-led. Uh, this can be collaborative, this can be cooperative, uh, and can include other nonprofit models. Go to the next slide, please. So the structure, we don't have time to go into much detail here, but we can just say this is based on the classic community land trust model coming out of the US, coming out of other European cities like Brussels over the last years, involving local government, but uh, civil society led. It's, a, it's a, uh, a citizen's foundation. New for Germany is, it, is that this foundation, when it's founded in the next few months, will be both democratically controlled and local. Uh, it will involve people living in the projects, uh, as well as people in the neighborhoods around these projects, as well as people from local government, as well as people who have donated, as well as experts who uh, can help to uh, advise us as to the best way forward uh, for affordable housing. Okay, into the next slide. So finally, coming to my conclusions, uh, my own story concludes with this statement. Uh, it's a good idea to support community land trusts in order to support co-housing, cooperatives, and other affordable housing initiatives, the opportunities uh, for our respective cities in doing this is supporting innovation and inclusion in ways that our governments can't and in ways that certainly private free market housing developers will never do. This is encouraging uh, and strengthening our local democratic structures. We have opportunities to support projects that we can learn from, uh, how to create, how to manage affordable housing, how to involve people. In doing this, we can support uh, and learn about community ownership models, so not just waiting for the government to buy everything and manage everything, but to move forward again with cooperations between local government and civil society, kind of a common good models. And perhaps most importantly, to work on uh, strategies that will help us for the long term, not just developing housing that's affordable for one year, five years, or even 20 years, but really uh, to try to move out of the crisis mentality and, to, and to, to finally find some more stability in our housing so that people can relax and, and enjoy their lives. Okay, those are my conclusions. I look forward to the questions and the discussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, um, Michael. And thank you very much also for highlighting the ties with the um, with different types of model, because we, we don't want to say that one model is better than other to achieve the, the final goals of solutions for adequate housing, but we need to maintain the ties in different 
sectors and different and with social movements, with activists, as well with governments to redesign as well uh, public policies. Um, I give the floor now to uh, Levente Poliak, who is um, going to manage the, the part of, uh, it's going to facilitate the question and answer that have been collected until now. Uh, I've seen there are uh, many of them, so I, I give you the floor to Levente, please. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Arthur and Michael. These are very interesting presentations. We got a lot of questions. Uh, if you wish, you can uh, facilitate our lives, the audience, if you put your questions in the Q&A. But we try to collect all the, all the inputs. Unfortunately, we cannot address all the questions because there are many of them, but we try to cluster them and, and connect them. So I would like to start with Artur. There were many questions about the conditions to access. How, can, how are tenants selected? How can you ensure that there is diversity between different kinds of uh, people? And also if it's possible to rent units and not buy. These were the main concerns. Yes. Um... Just as a general information, uh, the CLTB is always very happy to welcome uh, people who would like to visit and discover our projects. So please do not hesitate if you come by Brussels and also invite us to conferences. It's my colleague Joaquin who will come. He's the manager of the Chic project. So just really don't hesitate to send us an email. On the question of how people are selected. So first of all, they have to be under the social housing income ceilings, which are established by the Brussels region. And then we have a waiting list. It's the most um, fair way for us because everybody's got a particular situation, but we cannot take that into account because it wouldn't be fair. So uh, some people have been on the waiting list for a long time. Some of them for the average time we think takes around five, six years before they can get into a CLT project, which is half the time it takes to get social housing in Brussels, which is on average 10 years. On the question of the diversity, um, we actually separated, so everybody's under a social housing income level, but then we separated them into four more categories, meaning that um, the people at the lowest categories of income, people who are usually on uh, minimum income uh, revenue, um, they will be able to buy for less than the people on the higher level of social income revenues. So I don't know if it's very clear or said like that, but the idea is that the more expensive houses for people that have the higher incomes can finance lower prices for uh, lower priced housing units. So we try to compensate with different levels of income. It creates a social mix. It creates a diversity inside uh, the housing clusters. Um, and it creates also sometimes a bit of a problem because the people at the higher income ceilings, for them, it might be more interesting to get on the private market. If they join the community interest uh, project, it's usually because they believe in the project or they want to have a co-ownership experience that is more integrated within the city. On the other diversity aspect, uh, we try, we have no criteria, no, we try really to target people who are in need of housing. Um, so, yeah. Um, on the question of rents, it's something that is, it's, it's not, let's say, in the DNA of the community and trust of Brussels. We try really to make people own their homes, to take them out of the uh, rental, uh, to take them out of the rental market, provide them a bit of a, of a stability, of a security, you know that they can never be evicted. But when people are over 50, they cannot get even a social mortgage. So that's why we are trying to develop rental for these specific kinds uh, of um, target groups. And uh, there was something else. I, I saw a question I wanted to... No, I, 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 think, I think we're yeah. good for, for now. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hope this answers at least some of the questions. I would move over to, to Michael. And a little bit, I mean, also concerning Brussels, people were asking about the relationship with municipalities, but I would like to put this question on a, on a broader scale, uh, because you mentioned there's, uh, you're working on more collaboration with municipalities and more strategic collaboration is needed. What would this mean in your case in Berlin? And what is your experience? Because you've been researching a lot of cases across Europe. Uh, how can municipalities support uh, co-housing and CLT initiatives? Okay, well, to start with, I think it's important for all of us to reflect on the, the connections between 
our housing initiatives. So if that's cooperative housing, collaborative housing, or even a community land trust, that in the end for this to work well, we are in a, a local uh, landscape or a policy landscape. So uh, we, we, we need to support, let's call it progressive reform in our respective cities that deal with, and I mentioned this, real estate, rent, as well as housing. So we're in that context. And uh, we, we, it, it's not enough to exist as independent islands with special projects. So that, that's an important lesson for me in Berlin. And I'm happy to say that, uh, that Berlin is actually doing fairly well, uh, thanks to an active civil society and a cooperative local government that, in fact, we're making progress with uh, reforming housing, rental, and real estate policy. The Community Land Trust uh, is getting attention at the district level as well as the city state level now. So we're, we're, we're encouraged that, uh, that the communication is, is, is uh, healthy enough here that we can take further steps in the next years. But again, so I, I say building off of a policy foundation and then looking at, at, at these particular initiatives. So a Community Land Trust is a new one. And, you know, we won't change the housing market from one year to the next and not even in five years or 10 years. Right. But we're, 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 we're working into this landscape. Thank you very much, Michael. I would move back to Arthur asking a little bit about the, their relationship with the Brussels municipality. What did uh, the Brussels municipality or rather region uh, help in establishing the CLT? Well, first of all, they, uh, they, provide us with funding every year. Uh, we, um, um, there, there are several social housing uh, systems working in, in Brussels and we are one of them. So we get uh, financing for uh, the general organization uh, in that way. And uh, they also provide funding to buy uh, land and to build uh, housing. And uh, um, we, we, we were recognized as a, uh, um, we we, are, we get more and more recognized by the city as a legitimate social housing provider. I won't go into too much detail because I don't master all of it. But um, yeah, it's it's essential to have uh, the city's support, especially since uh, we are working trying to find available land uh, to buy uh, to build our our uh, housing units. Okay, thank you, Artur. So it's very important that, uh, as you mentioned also in your presentation, that land can be, can be made available by cities. Michael mentioned uh, more strategic collaboration, working together on policies. Uh, we have a question for one very quick, uh, time for one very quick uh, and question related to the spread of CLTs. Uh, Michael, I would go back to you. Why is that Berlin after, you know, 500 cope housing is looking into the CLT model? Why is it a change in your strategy? Please, very quickly. That's a good question. Some people would say that Berlin already has enough options or models or structures to, to develop and manage affordable housing. We, what the Community Land Trust in Berlin would say, the Community Land Trust has some things very specific to offer that are, that are really new. So again, the cooperation uh, with, with the local government, but being civil society led and democratic, and the fact that it's for the long term. We, 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 we are concerned about developing uh, large amounts of city owned housing, which we're doing again, that maybe 20 years later, we'll go on back into the speculative market. So that, that's, that, th those are the main points. We, we think in fact, there is a niche, which could be a big one, uh that uh yeah we we're working to to fill so we look at it as a learning project and a learning project for berlin so people can reflect what are maybe the weaknesses of, of the other models which are not so bad but which things could be better thank you very much michael so i hope many of the uh, people in the audience also from municipalities also from initiatives they can inspire from the brussels clt and also berlin cooperatives uh, i would give it over to laura who will introduce the next speakers yeah thank, thank you thank you Levante, Levante. um so <laughs> so the next uh, two speakers will be dealing with uh, um more traditional forms of uh, 
um, collaborative housing and uh, we will talk about cooperatives. Uh, we have a case study that is from the city of Chemnitz um, from uh, Orba project called Altbau that is um, a project that is, um, is a transfer net of Orba after working around the, um, uh, the practice of uh, creating a um, housing agency in a shrinking city, uh, the city of Chemnitz. And Fulka Chuka is going to talk about the experience of creating uh, the cooperative um, within in a, in a situation of a shrinking city. And then we will have uh, um, Andreas Bertz, who's going to talk about, um, with more possibly historical perspective, about uh, the cooperative housing in Switzerland. So I give the floor to Urka. Uh, hi, please. Hi, everybody. Yeah. You find me in my office. Uh, I, I have to ride to work at the moment, so I normally use it. So uh, perhaps we can see my slides and I will come a little bit closer. So I'm speaking about our cooperative Brühl Pioniere. So the Brühl is a, is a part of, of the city center in Chemnitz and uh, it's called Olivar. And we were the pioneers who, who uh, jumped in to renovate some houses there. So we were founded, next please, we were founded in, in March 2013 by 12 inhabitants of Chemnitz. The most of them uh, are working in the creative businesses or as medical professional, uh, in, in medical professions. So uh, as uh, when I say we found it in March 2013, we, we needed two years before to, to uh, from the first meeting to, to find ourselves. So it took a long time uh, to start uh, to find the first house, uh, to buy the first house, uh, and we started renovation from June uh, 2013 and ended the first house in June 2015. Um, today we, we own three houses, so we bought some more after the first. Uh, and two, uh, 52 people living in our three houses and we have two business units. We invested uh, 2.4 million euros. Um, so next please. So maybe you know Chemnitz from from the autumn 2018 the, the uh, incredible uh, pictures all over Europe but uh, normally we are a shrinking city in Saxony we uh, had uh, 300,000 um, inhabitants in the end of the uh, socialist period now we have uh, 50,000 less so we had thousands of empty flats and buildings in our city and hundreds were demolished. But um, there's also, there was also a gap of bigger flats. So uh, this was the point where we started uh, our project. Next, please. So what we 12 people wanted was to, to live together in one building we wanted to live in bigger flats than before uh, with the same level of monthly spendings, of course, uh, for rents or for credit rates. We wanted to live in a higher level. Uh, we wanted, but we also wanted to live everybody in its own way. So we had uh, singles and families and each could create his own flat. So, in the picture you, you can see two of our houses. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but, but the, uh, you, you have a look on our backyard. So this was the first house and this was the second house. So next please. So this is, this is a, a short view on, on the 
third house, you, you can see different uh, stages in, in the house and you can see every flat is different from the other. So we had, we, tr we tried to, to make a, a very, very uh, creative uh, flats and so here's the next. So we had huge plans but we were a group of people with no money or nearly no money with no knowledge of the real estate market uh, with less of time because we all work in other professions and um, of course we were people which never built a house before in the in the picture you can see our our first ceo so um and our first house in the in the background so um it was the the, the main problem was to get the trust from from uh, other people from banks from uh, from the city administration that we can manage it um so this was one point uh, why it costs us two years from from the first meeting to the to the uh, first house. So next, please. Maybe it might be interesting how we how we finance finance it at the end. So uh, two point four million euros. I saw. Uh, I said. Um, so. The most of it were house bank credits and federal bank credits. So uh, the federal bank credits are much better, have much better conditions, but they can only be used for energetic renovation. So 20% were, were our own money for the equity, uh, uh, for, the, for the cooperative shares. 5% uh, were state funding, uh, it was a program for urban redevelopment and 10% was uh, our own work and, and additional private money uh, for making our uh, flats beautiful. So uh, it changed from, from house to house a little bit, uh, it was not the, the same um, the same parts of, of all of these um, uh, financial incomes uh, in, in each house. So here you can see us work. So we, we spend hundreds of, of hours to, to make our flats beautiful. Uh, we were better in destruction then in reconstruction um, and so the most time we spend on on destruction the old flats and then um, less time for to make it nicer uh, next please. so I can um, say people like us need somebody uh, who wants such projects and projects and has got the power to to support them uh, this means we need some people in city administrations which uh, gives support we we needed somebody in the banks uh, which gives support give support um, you need somebody who gives you time so uh, as i as i told you we needed two years from the first meeting to uh, founding our cooperative so you not need somebody who knows economical and legal possibilities uh, because we are not the experts you need a guide through the city administration because there are so many people you have to speak with about fire protection about uh, I don't know uh, everything so um, you need somebody who, who knows all this and uh, who guides you through this uh, administrative way uh, and 
Of course, it might be helpful if you have some networks of role models and good practices. So um, as we started, there were only five or six big cooperatives in, in Chemnitz from, from the socialist time. So uh, with hundreds of labs, they were no role models. We had two or three cooperative uh, or co co well, co-housing projects, uh, but no cooperatives. So we had not such a role model. And um, now as, as we are finished, we, uh, we had two or three following projects in the city, uh, which got advices from us. And so um, maybe it will be a model for, for others in the city too. And of course you need somebody who is open-minded for creative, creative solutions because uh, we had a lot of creative solutions and not each we could uh, do, but some, of, uh, some we could. So the, Next is here you can see some some views in in our new flats. Uh, the CEO from the beginning and me in my in my roof top flat. So and perhaps the last two slides. Um, I told you what we needed. So I can tell you too why you should be this kind of somebody. So people which build houses don't move to another town. Um, for a shrinking city, this is a very important fact. Uh, people which were supported by public administration uh, uh, are open-minded to support, support public interests too. So we have a lot of actions where we, we, where we support uh, parties or public in, uh, other public interests. So people who are successful can be a role model, as I told you, for upcoming projects. And people who feel safe in their living conditions produce children, as I told you. So we have 20 children now in our uh, community and that's it. Last slide, you can see one of it. So thank you. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you uh, Volker for uh, telling the experience of uh, Chemnitz and going out to one of the uh, big uh, cities that are in the radar of many of us. Um, I also would like, for, before we, we move to the next speaker, I would like to come back to um, one of the questions that has been asked online by Sasha Gajewski and uh, Philip Klaus, that they were questioning uh, the model of uh, the CLT in Brussels and were they asking the plus 25% added value, they were asking for whom is the 25% added value for the municipality of the seller. And um, so as I was answering in the chat, I'm not sure everybody has access to, to this information, but I want to share it saying that this is not actually, an, um, it's the 25% is for the seller. So meaning that the seller, once they don't want to stay in the apartment anymore, is allowed to sell it and for the original plan, can get the, to sell it for the original price plus 25% uh, of the added value. This is in this way, they will build capital for, to stay affordable. And, um, and so um, other information that also you would like to ask to answer that may be also shared with the, within the UIA uh, project of uh, Calico. And we will keep all the questions, also those that are not uh, uh, answered right away in this, uh, in this format. So the next uh, speaker is Andreas Dertz and uh, is, uh, is an architect and founder of the housing cooperative uh, Kraft Kraftwerk 1. He's also an activist part of the Nora Network, a national network, international network for urban research and action. 
and is also uh, the board of the directors of uh, the Swiss Housing Cooperative Association in Zurich and CEO of Article. I think I covered everything of Andreas, so he's going to tell about his experience uh, in uh, in in the city of Zurich and and talking a little bit about the context as well. So thank you very much uh, to Andreas. Thank you and hello everybody. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, conference. That's the first time I do it online. I try to do it well and I hope you understand me. Uh, <coughs> the fonts of the presentation aren't right, but we will manage that. Laura, introduce me. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, in Switzerland, we have a big amount of cooperatives. It's a, an old model. It's about 100 years old. And the idea of the Swiss cooperative was that as a private initiative, they build uh, houses for the upcoming industrialization for about 100 years. You don't know really, but Switzerland uh, has the image of a, a, of a, a country that uh, they don't only have a, a, a landscape and uh, <laughs> finance, but uh, the, the history of Switzerland is a history of industrialization. Uh, it, and uh, uh, in this history, it was a collaboration from the cooperatives with the public sector, and I think it was. Uh, it's very important that uh, the public sector has an important role in that long history of the cooper uh, cooperatives. You see that the urban cities in Switzerland have a, a huge amount of uh, cooperatives. In Zurich, that's an old uh, uh, slide, uh, we have, yeah, thank you. In Zurich, we have uh, 25 of all rented flats are uh, not for uh, not for profit. And you see all these uh, red dots on the map on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the map of Zurich are is our cooperative uh, uh, housing units and you see they are uh, represented in every uh, district of the city. Uh, I think that's very important. It's not uh, the idea of the Swiss cooperatives is not only social housing, it's kind of self-help organization for uh, also for the middle class, for the poor and rich too. I think it's for us it's very important to have this mix of, uh, of people in our cooperatives. The challenges we have uh, we, now with, with this system, you, as you can imagine, these cooperatives are 100 years long and old and in the 70s we had uh, some problems because they were a kind of tired, they were selfish and this uh, because uh, the, the big amounts of flats that were built were built after the two world wars and in the 70s we were confronted with cooperatives that uh, aren't moving and were kind of uh, boring institutions. Uh, in the 19th then, after the first crash of the uh, real estate sector and with the youth movements about, uh, after 80, there were people coming uh, with uh, new ideas, with uh, alternative ideas of living together this kind of Wohngemeinschaft was a new uh, topic and they realized that there is already a nice model from these cooperatives and we, as I was part of it, we kind of uh, uh, took that model for uh, our ideas and make kind of new, uh, of a spring in that, in that movement. The challenges we are confronted now, the next, uh, the next slide, is uh, the housing supply and the question what means affordable. The next slide, you see in Switzerland we have a kind of different situation in the urban regions and in the landscape. In the urban regions you know that from other spots too, uh, people aren't able to, uh, to uh, hire a, a, a flat because it's uh, too expensive. The next one. 
Then the, another challenge is the population development and the land requirements. And the question is how much is enough? That you know Switzerland is rich. The next slide, please. Switzerland is, is a rich, um, uh, a rich uh, country. And that means that the, the ideas of the people is to use also a, a lot of space. You see that, but the, you see also the, the impact of the cooperatives the, 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 on the left side. Cooperatives use about 38 square meters per person. And in the private sector, you see that this amount is, is rising up, up to about 60 square meters per person. Next one. Then uh, growth and demography. Uh, the question, what should we build next? That's really interesting because uh, we have a change of household forms. Um, in the urban regions in Switzerland, more than 70% of the households have one or two persons only. And the uh, real estate sector builds other things. The real, sector, se the real estate sector builds normally flats with for four or three or four persons, but the needs of the market are different. The next slide. And we have an aging uh, population. You see these two pictures of Switzerland in uh, between uh, 1970 and 2016. Swiss population has aged by about 10 years. Next one. And of course, we are talking about these virus problems in the moment, but the real problem we have is the climate pro pro problem and we should think about also how much but also how we should going to build. The next slide. What are the replies from our cooperatives? Next. Uh, we try to develop uh, our uh, housing projects participatory. This is an example from Kraftwerk One. We founded this cooperative in 94. And the first building, Hartung One, was uh, uh, finished in 2001. You see, it's about a long period of development. And it was one of these first uh, cooperative buildings uh, for alternative housing in Switzerland and I think in the whole of Europe. The idea was to have households up to about 20 persons mixed also with single households to have uh, a, 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 a rich and, and, and enrichment community that is really diverse. The next one. Then 2012, also Kraftwerk One, the question with all these uh, single households, we try to develop new typologies, this cluster wohnen. Uh, it's uh, now uh, done about all over Europe. The idea that you have a single person, not only a, a flat for you, for you, that you have kind of a, a sub unit that you can use with your own kitchen, but you're uh, part of a bigger of a bigger flat, of a bigger community, where you share a big uh, kitchen for all. Next slide. Also the question of uh, mixed diversity, that's a project in Zurich, also Kalkbreite, Kalkbreite 2014. The idea was also to have a, a, a diverse offer of, of flats you see in the background all the possible flats and uh, the size of these units, you see that it's very diverse. Next. And the question of the sustainable neighborhoods. Uh, it was uh, the idea to think in, in neighborhoods and not to think only in, in, in houses or buildings. This uh, example is Meral's uh, Warren, you heard about 2015. It was an initiative of the Auros Association that, that uh, I'm part of the board. The next one. And now we are thinking about, because our cities don't offer possibilities uh, for cooperatives, you, you know, because we can't uh, uh, buy this land because it's uh, too expensive. 
Then we try to uh, building a kind of building to periphery. These are very interesting uh, places. We in, in, in the past, we hadn't uh, focused it, but now we have it on the focus and we think it's very interesting. Also a, a project from this cooperative Kraftwerk One uh, in the outskirts of Zurich, peripheral, also with the idea to be part of the bigger of a, of a bigger uh, public public environment, and it's very interesting because uh, new, there's in this uh, in this countryside or in these peripheral uh, cities, they are coming new peoples with a new ideological background, and I think also politically it's interesting because uh, there is a kind of a a, a new uh, a new way to live there in these regions. The next one. And the uh, last idea is also to scaling up. That's a project that is uh, now in the building process. It will be finished about 22. And you think it's, it's uh, a, a question of the, of, the, of the scale. We are building 560 residential units for also uh, with two cooperatives. And it's, it was also kind of a uh, new self-understanding to do that big projects. M me as a project developer, I have in the moment about 800 flats on my table. And you see that uh, it's very important what the Swiss cooperatives are doing now. And for the rest, what's the role of the public authorities in the associations? Next slide. We have uh, municipal regulations in the city of Zurich. That's really interesting because the city of Zurich has um, uh, one way, on, uh, one aim is to get a 2000 watt society and that one third of all rented apartments should be not for profit. And the uh, municipality also uh, uh, gives some housing subsidies. Then on the cantonal uh, layer, we have a cantonal regulation also for housing subsidies and on the federal uh, layer we have a housing promotion law. We have mortgage guarantees for cooperative and uh, a uh, central issuing office for non-profit housing construction and uh, performance mandates for cooperative associations. You see it's uh, really interesting to have this uh, also state uh, support. And the association I'm part of, uh, we have a fond agreement. It's interest bearing, repayable loans for all cooperatives. We have a solitary found foundation, also interest bearing, repayable loans for financially weak, but also developable cooperatives. And a foundation, Solinvest, who gives equity participation. Next one. And that's, you see how cooperatives in Switzerland are financed. We have kind of another uh, financing model with, of mortgage. It's uh, in Switzerland with 20% equity, you can build a, a housing project and you have 80% percent mortgage from the banks. And also we have all, 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 only to bring this 20%, and 10 to 50 percent are coming from the Swiss state with all this model I presented. And then you have only to bring 5 to 10 percent for, 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 from the tenants with shares from the cooperative. And uh, then you see 50 percent of the mortgage are refundable and that's unique uh, in the whole uh, world. I think that in Switzerland 65 percent of the mortgage is not refundable. You have this for every time. That's a short introduction <laughs> and I'm interested in your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Um, I, I think we, would, we could go on and talking about these things for the rest of the day, but this is just a, a sample of uh, the kind of work you're doing. And I think it, it provided a very nice perspective also looking at neighborhood level and the urban uh, perspectives rather than just the, the single um the single building um i want to 
share some of the things that comes also through Twitter. Uh, for instance, uh, we have um, Michaela Kauer who joined us for the launching of this uh, activities, this series of events, and she's the coordinator of the Urban Agenda. And she reminds them in a, in a tweet that in our um, EU housing partnership, we have um, a specific policy recommendation on co-ownership, co-management and co-housing. And this uh, plan, this policy plan has been also submitted to of the European Commission and these informations are available online and you can also have a look at that on Futurium which is the website that the European Commission officially created for the Urban Agenda Partnership and uh, without no further discussion I will uh, give the floor to you uh, and, uh, and to Levente who has been collecting the questions uh, while Andreas and Volker were speaking. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura, and thank you, Volker and Andreas, for the very interesting presentations. People were very active uh, uh, sending us questions. I would start with Volker because few people were uh, interested about how did you negotiate with the banks. Maria Chiara Secco and Gaetano Di Palo were asking about how did you convince the banks uh, to give the loans, what kind of collateral did you have to uh, use and in the end how did you get the financial knowledge? You mentioned it's very important to have uh, somebody to help with the financial uh, framework. Please Foka, you have to unmute yourself. So at the beginning we had a building engineer who, who make all the financial plan on, on spendings. So um, he told us how, how much renovation will cost uh, and uh, or might, might cost. So we needed more in the end. And um, so we, we have some cooperative banks in, in Germany and, and also in Chemnitz, a, a local cooperative bank. And so we asked them to, to, uh, to support a cooperative and uh, they were very proud to, to uh, they, they told us you are the rural pioneers and we are the bank pioneers. So, so of course we, we, had to, we had to talk with them and and um, and and they of course they got mortgages on our houses and and for the credits but uh, and 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 some but a very very low uh, safety secure financial security from the from the members uh, so if somebody will go wrong. Uh, so we have to pay, we as a members have to pay uh, some thousand euros each, but, but it's much lower than if I took a credit by my own for a for whole house. So that's why we decided for the cooperative way, uh, not as, not as a, a ownership, but, but as a cooperative to, to put the, uh, the security to the, to the uh, business, not to, to our private. private. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Volker. I mean, um, I moved to Andreas. Uh, many people were interested in why you showed on, almost only new built houses. Why is that cooperatives, housing cooperatives, uh, so much into building new instead of renovating older uh, building stock. Francesco Minora was asking this and also Tukce Tugran uh, kind of quoted some directives of sustainability you now to have a, a, a smaller environmental footprint. Uh, there's a lot of national policies and EU policies to actually promote more the reuse of old buildings instead of building new. So how is this idea situated in the cooperative movement in Switzerland? Yeah, I told you that, uh, that the new way of cooperative building in, in Switzerland is, is, is not so old. It's, uh, it started in the 90s. But of course, we have the most of the cooperative uh, flats are in old buildings. I didn't show that at all. I had only 10 minutes and I had more. <laughs> but, uh, this would, would be another presentation to show that the existing buildings. Uh, in Zurich, uh, 35,000 flats are from cooperatives and about 10,000 are new ones 
and the others are old and we are renovating this also. Thank you. I hope this satisfies uh, our, our audience. I would move back to Falk. Uh, there were a lot of questions about diversity and if we have time, I will ask the same to Andreas. Uh, Ramses Grande was asking something very interesting that of course you put a lot of uh, work into, a lot of time into building up this process. What would mean this for maybe lower income people who have no time available or in general, how would, how would you see time as a, as a factor of uh, exclusion? And also Boyana Kosgrabar was asking about the, the selection process. How did you add your, your partners? How did you build up the team of uh, building your cooperative housing? So I think in the beginning, there were some people who already lived together and they had to leave their house because of renovation and, and they know the, the uh, rents were, were rise and uh, would rise. And, and so they uh, decided to, to do it their own way. So they already knew each other uh, and then they put some people into this, this network uh, uh, who they think they could help. So me personally came um, because they, they knew I have a business. I, I know a little bit about uh, financial figures and, and so uh, they added me or asked me if, I, if I'm interested and I was. So um, because for me it was a challenge to, to do it. So we had some people with, with uh, lower incomes and there are two ways in Germany to, to manage it or in our cooperative to manage it. The first way was um, you, you can get uh, credits for, for buying uh, cooperative shares. Uh, very very good conditions and and so this this was one way to to find the, the equity uh, uh, and the other way was um, we, we just managed you get a, 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 a little bit less or a, a, a smaller flat and and you got a bigger flat and if you want the roof you have to pay a little bit more and, and something like that so so it was discussions it were discussions we we lost some people on this way of course uh, and um, we had to find you but but it worked so rather an organic process than something planned from the the beginning of course thank you uh, for care i would uh, put uh, one que one minute question to Andreas about diversity as well. Sasha Gajewski was uh, reminding us that uh, cooperative housing in Copenhagen is already very expensive, for example. Is uh, cooperative housing in Switzerland affordable? And Joanna Daskalopoulou was asking about how can these cooperatives cater for women, for example, single parents, all kinds of more vulnerable groups. What is the policy uh, towards this? Uh, cooperative housing in Switzerland is the most affordable way to live in Switzerland. There are no cheaper ways to live than cooperative housing. And uh, on this, uh, yeah, it's it's very off. Uh, it's very open. It's very open for very different people. Uh, some cooperatives also have solidarity solidarity funds to to support in a private way also uh, people to get in. And of course, in, in a situation where you don't have enough flats, it's a problem to get because they are, they are uh, inhabited, they are not free, they are not on the market. And if you have no uh, new people who are coming in, it's the question how can you be, be open also in the, in the future if all flats are, are already taken. And we are uh, discussing a lot on, the, on that topic. Also on the question, would it better to be only uh, social housing as the European Union is to try to make it that the cooperative housing is only for the poorest. We don't find that this is a good idea. We, we find that this kind of private initiative is very important. 
to have that kind of 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 of, of uh, living uh, possibility also for the for richer people, because it's not normal that you have to pay your salary to a private investor to a, a speculative uh, firm. I think that's a really the wrong way, and uh, but. In the way you are a happy community, you have to be very open-minded, and you think about that your 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 uh, doors are open for everybody. Thank and you, of Andres. Course, in in this in this diverse uh, uh, flat of we do, there are possibilities for women alone, for uh, vulnerable people. Uh, be care of that. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you, Andres. And this is a very important message, I think, for the whole discussion. And it, we can see that a uh, big part of our audience is very much uh, interested about how to create tools that ensure the diversity in these new forms of housing. So this is a very important message that we will have to come back later as well. Thank you, Falk and Andres, for uh, answering the questions. I would give it over to Laura and we <laughs> do the next Yes. Questions. Yes, yes. It seems that it works, this uh, process of uh, giving words to one another. We're very worried about this. So I just want to um, uh, obviously uh, warmly thank the, the past speaker, but also think of uh, some links that can be built through this kind of conversation that we are having with lots of other people that are uh, working in, uh, in this topic. I'm thinking of uh, um, that last year with the um, Housing Europe, uh, International Union of Tenants and Delphi in Paris, we collected a lot of uh, interesting practices for the European Responsible Housing Award and some information, some models on cooperative housing. I remember that we, um, there was a prize given to La Borda uh, a project in Barcelona. There are many websites like Urbamont that is also collecting different case studies around uh, cooperative housing and collaborative forms of housing. And so everybody's encouraged also to further look and uh, further ask uh, questions. And it's interesting also that in the chat, I don't know if it was um, uh, shared with everyone, uh, we have uh, comments or saying, um, for instance, that uh, yeah, as much as I like all this model, is 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 still even the economist uh, was somebody writing in the chat saying even the economist said that uh, came to the conclusion that ownership in itself is part of the problem. So this is a thing that we we won't give an answer now, but it's uh, quite interesting to look at how different models of interpretation of non speculative forms of tenures have been experimented in different places, and so we are lucky enough to. Have have also um, people uh, speaking from uh, Budapest, uh, from a UIA project called Eco Housing. So they they use this um, title for the project. And as far as I know, I'm not. I don't know directly. This project is one of the first uh, co-housing um, experiment in Budapest, and also uh, focusing on uh, reduction of CO2 and energy poverty. So. It's also a new project for me, so I'm very happy and uh, curious to know about uh, Rebecca Shabo, if I pronounce well your name, uh, telling us about uh, your project. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Laura, and uh, good morning for everyone. So yes, my name is Rebecca Sabo, uh, and I am working as a deputy mayor uh, in a district of Budapest. It's called Zuglo. It's important because I will mention it a few times during my presentation. Uh, so first of all, um, I would like to show you a short video of our eco-housing uh, project. If it's uh, possible, I would like the organizers to start the video. Thank you. Zuglo has gained the opportunity to implement a unique project by being granted in the UIA or Urban Innovative Actions Programme of the European Commission. As the main objective of the Eco Housing Project, an innovative near zero energy balanced municipal social building with smart solutions is being designed and constructed to provide low cost housing to district residents. The goal of the project is to build a safe, sustaining community based on intergenerational collaboration, inclusion and support for a healthy and sustainable lifestyle. Yes, 
thank you. Uh, so as you uh, might have seen, uh, this project is supported by the Urban Innovative Action. And basically, uh, it aims to be a model for establishment of a collaborative social housing community, which is co-created by the municipality and also its residents. We would like to uh, provide a secure, of course, non-profit, a low-cost and affordable housing, and also to meet the environmental standards regarding the climate crisis we are facing. And uh, we would like to also uh, create space and community together with our future tenants. This building will be uh, a multi-story construction. Uh, it will have 27 residential units of different sizes, and we will have a community area as well. Uh, during the construction, we will use recyclable ma materials, like for example, there will be wood in the structure, which is really not common in, in Hungary. And uh, we will use, of course, renewable energy sources, uh, and we would like to create like a greener urban environment. So basically the target group, I mean, to whom we are building uh, uh, this building, is a cross-section of people. Uh, there will be uh, families from the district, from our Zuglo district, who are in need of housing. So it's like uh, you can think about single parent families or larger families, disabled people, or even elderly couples. And uh, they will be uh, selected through a new uh, selection criteria system, which will be prepared during the project by the social working group. So next slide, please. Yeah, um, and there are the actors involved. So you might have seen at the end of the video that there are several partners. So the lead partner is uh, uh, the municipality where I, uh, where I work. Of course, we have our municipal asset management uh, company. Uh, they will uh, be responsible for the maintenance of the building uh, later on. Uh, there are uh, SMEs, uh, two with the know-how of architecture and energetical issues, and one with the, the strong process management and communication skills. There are NGOs in the project. Uh, they deal with environmental research, green architecture, and also there is one with social housing. And uh, we also included the university. Uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge, and they really uh, work on the also on the um, scientific part and the research and working with the people part. So, yeah, one more, yeah. Um, basically the background, uh, why is it so important for us? As uh, Laura mentioned and, and the first part that housing is a really serious issue in Europe and also in Hungary. We can say that there is a housing crisis in Budapest uh, and unfortunately there is no social housing strategy on the national level, on the governance level. So uh, the growing need for housing is a very strong pres pressure on municipalities and uh, as I am, as a deputy mayor, I am responsible for social issues as well. Uh, I have to say that in my uh, uh, everyday work, I face a lot of uh, human dramas and, and a lot of problems which are coming uh, from the situation that people just cannot afford to have a decent housing in Budapest. So our municipality decided to tackle this uh, issue. And um, we would like to show a kind of best practice example with this eco-housing uh, project. So and um, on the next uh, slide, you can see a few uh, pictures. So it will be uh, planned through co-designing. There will be community spaces. And it was also a bit difficult because uh, when we started to plan the building, we didn't have the tenants yet. We don't have the tenants yet, in fact, at the moment. But we created a, like a focus group, which was a bit typical for the, uh, for the social background of the tenants. And we started the planning with them. So for example, it resulted in the community spaces. You can see the corridors of the building. They are really connecting uh, the apartments and they can also serve a little bit as community uh, spaces. And also we will have a large 100 square meter community room uh, in the basement. And also what we will do with the tenants after the selection is the creation of the, of the backyard uh, garden. As you can see on the photo, there will be a backyard garden. So, and on the next slide, uh, you can see just as an example that uh, we will really focus uh, 
uh, on that our building will be a nearly net zero energy building. So there will be uh, heat pumps uh, uh, providing the heating and cooling as well. Uh, we will have photovoltaic panels. We will have uh, efficient uh, lightning system and, and energy management uh, systems, which will uh, uh, which is very important uh, because of the climate crisis we are facing and I have to tell you that this is really not typical for social housing in Hungary so usually social housing is not this type of building and on the next slide uh, I would like to show that um, this will be a smart building as well so we will have smart solutions on one hand because it will be very important for us to measure uh, as well uh, the the energy use and, and emissions, but also it will be very important to give a feedback for the residents uh, that they can also follow their energy use, electricity use, and uh, and um, if, if, if it's a, a sustainable way, they live in the building, and we will organize for them mentoring programs and trainings as well to kind of uh, learn together uh, how to live in, in such a building, because probably some features will be new uh, for them as uh, they are coming uh, mostly from, from difficult social backgrounds. So it will be a long uh, co-learning process as well. Uh, and uh, this is also included in the project. So after building uh, uh, the building, we will work together with the tenants uh, in, in mentoring programs um, to, to create a real uh, collaborative uh, community. So, and uh, on the next uh, slide, uh, I would like to mention a little bit the challenges we are facing. So, uh, yeah, basically the, the project uh, started uh, in, uh, uh, in September 2018. Uh, and after uh, an, an important point that uh, we started uh, uh, to, to check again the plans and then we had to realize that already the, the construction market has changed and the prices of this kind of buildings and investments uh, have raised. I mean, they, they are higher. So, of course, this is also uh, an important issue when you really want to build something from uh, from uh, money from the European Union, which is very very important, and we're grateful for that. But then you always have to recalculate a little bit uh, your your possibilities. Also, there was a a, a, prob a kind of challenge with the, with the authorization because we wanted to apply new construction solutions, as I mentioned you regarding the wood, for example which is not common in Hungary. So we had to deal with the authorities, but now everything is fine with them. The co-design element is also uh, not easy. Uh, as I mentioned, we didn't have the tenants at first. We're gonna uh, select them a little bit later, but still we wanted to involve people uh, in the planning. So it was also something we had to uh, think about. Uh, I would say, yeah, leadership political commitment, just one thing that as a municipality is the lead partner, but we had elections, like municipal elections uh, the last year. And it's very interesting when I am deputy mayor, I'm a politician, uh, I started the project, I'm still in the project, fortunately, but for example, the mayor and some of the leaders of the district have changed. So we had to, they are supporting the project, of course, but we had to discuss it with them. And it also caused, I would say, some small challenges and, uh, and uh, small delays in the project. And of course, internal communication is sometimes uh, difficult when SMEs, NGOs, universities, municipalities have to work together. I think this was also something uh, we, we worked on. And now I would say it's without uh, any problem. So I would like to, uh, thanks for uh, your attention. Uh, I hope uh, I could show some, some highlights of, of eco-housing project and uh, maybe later on I will be happy to, happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you very much for presenting. And also um, bringing the voice of uh, of, in your role as a politician uh, and uh, and I think it was very interesting to also bring in the lights and shadows and the challenges of uh, this ambitious project I would say for 
for for for your context um, in bringing it to us uh, as showing that um, not just a good project is it comes on its own uh, just because you you want to create collaborative forms of housing and there are lots of tensions that played out and and they have to be brought into the picture um, I also would like to um, give the floor to the next speaker because the next speaker is um, Darinka who's uh, an assistant professor in the Faculty of Architecture and Built Environment at Delft University and she has been working with Urban also as a policy advisor for many years and she uh, when we invited Darinka we also thought that she could give us a perspective on the the broadest uh, definition we can use of collaborative housing, there are many also critical aspects in that the concept of co-housing, like who gains out of it, uh, who profits, how is our all cooperative non-speculative in a certain way? I'm just pushing the boundaries and I'm just exaggerating a little bit. But to say, um, are we sure that, that what we, we are doing is adequate in a certain way? And I also um, would like to say that this uh, kind of discussion go beyond the environment that we uh, work on within the um, urban EU urban policies of uh, uh, with Orbax and UIA. I've seen that in the question and answer there was uh, somebody from Taiwan who was uh, enjoying uh, our discussion, joining our discussion, and uh, and I think that this is really I'm really glad to see that the, we can use these tools also to um, to have different voices in, uh, in, uh, in this debate. So um, I'll uh, I keep you on hold for now for the question and answer later on, Rebecca, and we give the floor to Darinka if uh, that's okay. So thank you very much for now. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Laura, uh, for that introduction. And uh, well, thank you again uh, for, to all the hosts, the organizers of this uh, web conference and um, uh, more generally of this initiative, this new initiative to combine, to join forces between U UIA and URBAC to work on the specific issue of housing. I think this was a, a much needed and very welcome initiative. And uh, well, I'm lucky to, uh, and happy to be here today with you. Um, so if we could start the presentation, please. Yes, thank you. The first slide. Uh, we have heard a wide variety of terms and concepts and labels and models of, of what we call uh, bottom-up, citizen-led, uh, community-led, and so on and so forth, housing forms. Um, indeed, uh, this wide array shows us a, a rich diversity, and it, it tells us that a lot is going on. It tells us that uh, people all over Europe and even beyond are looking for alternatives. So this begs the question, which in my case, as I work at the university, I teach, I do research, this question is a, a, a scientific question also. Um, looking beyond the specific labels and, and examples, we as scientists, um, we want to make sense of what is going on at a wider societal level. Why are we talking so much about this today? And I would like to introduce this term of collaborative housing that many of us, uh, I've heard it repeatedly in many, in, in many presentations, um, from a, the re research community in, in Europe at least, uh, we have an a network where we gather and we discuss uh, housing issues. It's called the European uh, Network for Housing Research, ENHR. For five years now, we started a new working group to study these types of housing, and we call it collaborative housing. Why? Because unlike in traditional or conventional forms of housing provision, uh, which are either market-based, so a developer produces housing for a consumer, so everything is already ready for the consumer to just pick a house and move in, right? Or social housing providers also, they produce housing. But to what extent do the end users, the residents have a say in the project? Not only in the architecture, but also in the way they are gonna live in this new housing, right? 
So collaborative housing, as opposed to conventional housing forms, has in common, all these forms we're discussing today, has in common that residents, first of all, they want to have a very strong level of participation throughout the process, from, from the very conception through the development or redevelopment in the case of uh, refurbishment, for instance, or repurposing of a building, and even expanding the, the life of the project by saying we want to manage collectively, manage many aspects of our living together, the social activities, the spaces, the maintenance, um, et cetera. So this requires collaboration. This requires decision-making, which is collective, which can be slow, can be riddled by conflict, by disagreement, people dropping out, etc. However, the understanding that collaboration is at the center of all this form is what gives us this um, common thread through which we need to find new approaches. So basically all these forms that you see there, co-housing, uh, which by the way, co-housing is a specific model. If we look at it uh, scientifically, it is a, a specific model that was born in the 80s in Denmark and then was adopted in the US. So this is why we do not uh, use co-housing for the whole umbrella side note so co-housing as a specific form community land trusts cooperatives in many different forms across the world they all form part of the big diverse family um, if we go to the next slide please and we see that in reality this is nothing new there is a resurgence if we if we believe this is what's happening of old and new models and new interpretations of models but if we look at history around the world, this type of housing alternatives have sprung up at different points in time, led by either industrialization and urbanization uh, over 100 years ago, the workers' movements. Um, then in the 70s, if I take a big jump, there was also some emancipatory movements, uh, such as the, the, the female uh, emancipation and gender, and which thought, well, we need to organize domestic work differently so that the women also have more freedom to go to, to work. So why don't we um, live together amongst families and we organize our work in teams and men can also participate and can also take care of the children. So all these social trends um, and even technological trends have contributed to uh, different waves of thinking about housing as a collective endeavor. And today, in, in the 21st century, we see that there's a very strong revival of these um, different shapes and forms, but with new initiatives. So what characterizes, broadly speaking, the new forms of collaborative housing? And we see it through the presentations before, the concrete projects. We set these projects against a context of widespread, global, and um, structural housing crisis. I personally don't like to use the word crisis to refer to this problem because we've been talking about housing crisis for decades. A crisis is normally something that happens, has a peak, and then somehow it finishes by itself, it uh, completes its natural course, or we are able to manage. We haven't managed to do that. The housing crisis is not going away. So what are people doing? in the face of the inability, the shortcomings of established housing provision forms, the market, in many cases, institutional social housing providers as well. The inabilities of these actors to fulfill a number of needs, affordability, accessibility, social inclusion, sustainability, to name a few. Next one, please. So in this slide, you see, some classical old drivers or factors that have led people uh, over time in different places to opt to engage in collaborative housing forms. Because as we have heard uh, by speakers, collaborative housing takes time, takes a lot of engagement, personal commitment, and we see through data collected that actually there are a lot of projects that get started, but very few are completed. There's a high mortality rate. So, Researchers and also practitioners are busy trying to understand why, what are the main obstacles? Why can't we have more collaborative housing projects uh, realized actually? And well, when we look at what motivates people, 
we see that at the core is a, a, a longing for more community relations, more community life at the local scale. People want to do things together. They want solidarity. They want mutual help. They want more uh, community feeling. That has stayed always as a, as a core, as a, as a center uh, of collaborative housing models till today. Then, as I mentioned already, there's also a very strong component of gender gender balance in how we organize the domestic work. Um, the environment, already in the 70s, this started to become an issue and many uh, alternative groups of people at the time wanting to live more uh, sustainably. But today, with the severity of the climate change challenge, more and more the people want to live differently their daily life. So they require their housing to, the, to be adjusted to this new imperatives of recycling, reusing, sharing also. This also connects very much to the sharing economy, right? Demographic transition, sorry, I wasn't finished yet. <laughs> Demographic transition is also today a crucial driver because we have an aging society and we see that a lot of uh, people reaching that stage of their lives who are still fit, they don't want to live alone, they don't want to retire in a senior housing, they want to stay active. And for, the, for those people, a uh, senior, uh, collaborative housing is an option. And the last two drivers are relatively new because often it has been criticized that these models are only for the well-educated and, um, and relatively affluent middle-class people. And it's true in many cases, but today we see a research, uh, re researching of affordability. And this new, uh, can you click again, please? No, uh, uh, click. Uh, the same slide, but the, with, yeah, the, with the title. Yeah, so how can it be done? I referred to collaboration before, and this is crucial to understand uh, uh, the need to change the logic of how collaborative housing uh, can be done in any context. We need partnerships. We need to work with banks. We need to work with planners. We need to uh, work with architects and developers. And we need to work in a reciprocal uh, relationship of co-production. Next one, please. We see that happening also in um, new initiatives to embed collaborative housing logics within established uh, social housing provision systems. And just to show you a few examples where we have been acting doing research on, it is happening in the Netherlands more recently through the new model of bon cooperatives, in France with the Habitat Participative Movement, uh, in Vienna, the city works with uh, groups uh, in their new uh, urban development project and in Sweden, for instance, this has happened for many decades. Next one, please. So I was talking about a new way of working, and this requires that everyone across the board, all the stakeholders involved, they change their mentality to, from seeing residents as mere passive consumers of housing to active agents. Can you click again, please? Yes. And again, and again, and again. <laughs> So this requires from all of us a change of mindset. Next one, please. So this is my last slide and I, I want you to invite you to reflect on some critical points that have been already raised by some of the speakers. Very often uh, I have naysayers of skeptical people who tell me, but collaborative housing is marginal. It takes ages to complete. It's so difficult, it's expensive and it won't solve the housing crisis. And I answer, no, of course not. The housing crisis needs to be solved, as Michael Lafon was saying also, by a wider structural change in the way we look at housing, not as a mere commodity, but as a human right. And this is with the, the framework within which collaborative housing should happen. So we can be part of the solution through collaborative housing. Now, for this to happen, of course, policy, legal, and financial frameworks in every country, more or less, in some more than others, have to be adapted to the reality of a group doing things. Our planning systems are not used to groups, uh, to multi-households uh, designing with shared spaces. And our banking system doesn't trust in many countries, notably the Netherlands, for example, doesn't trust the citizens to acquire a collective loan and repay it. So we need also, in order to uh, make this change happen at the macro structural level, we need to acquire political support. And we see that in all cases, political <laughs> support 
through land acquisition has made collaborative housing possible. Collaborative housing relies on political support, at least for the land, because it's the most expensive item and private citizens very rarely are able to afford such uh, land for their housing project by themselves. So we need to understand what the sector is about. So we, we need clear definitions. We need figures to really show that, um, that the, the sector is growing, not just to claim that it is growing. And we also need ourselves, what are the linkages with uh, the wider structures that allow collaborative housing to stay affordable despite being inserted in a neoliberal uh, model that tends to regard housing as an asset and a commodity. So I would like you to invite also to read more. Uh, I had a couple, one more slide if you want to share it with the audience, um, which is the next one, please. It's about uh, some work I've done. Uh, mostly they are academic papers, but uh, myself and my group, if you show the next slide, last one, please. Yeah, you see there our logo. We are a research laboratory based at TU Delft and we have a website, collabresearch.net, uh, where we have a lot of general um, outputs, also for a general audience, not only research papers. So I invite you to get in touch with us um, if you have questions and if you have ideas to go work together. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Derinka, and um, thank you for also the, the last uh, information. I want just uh, to say that we are collecting um, references and, um, uh, from all the speakers and they will be um, available online uh, on URBAC, the UIA website. Um, I also would like to um, report on one of the comments that came to us. Uh, it comes from uh, Liat Roger, uh, and she is the coordinator of a partnership, uh, oh, sorry, of a network that we have in Orbach dedicated specifically on homelessness. Uh, and then she is also working on co-housing initiatives. And she said that um, through her research and her work, she's saying that co-housing initiatives are handling better the situation today and um, they say they are more resilient and she's saying this is also a new way or a possible way to push new initiatives to build on collaboration um, to use this crisis moment to spread more collaborative housing models so um, I would like to give the floor back to Levente for the last round of questions and then we will close our um, um, our meeting with the words of uh, Michalis Goodis from uh, Housing Europe, uh, the umbrella organization housing providers in Europe. So thanks Levante. Thank you very much Laura. Um, I would like to start with Rebecca and we have a question from Christina Kereste from Budapest I guess who's aware of how uh, an experiment, how important an experiment uh, this UA project is in Budapest, where there's no context for uh, similar uh, experiments. And she's asking that uh, this project required a lot of public investment, right? So what would be the conditions for transferring this to other parts of Budapest or other parts of the country or the region, if we don't have this kind of public investment possibility? <laughs> Well, uh, as you may know, uh, the municipalities have uh, buildings and apartments. So almost well, all the municipalities, uh, mainly in the cities, they are doing uh, housing, they are caring about housing issues and they have to spend money on that as well. So I think the basic is that uh, the question, how do we spend that money? Of course, this building will be a, quite a special example, but a lot of uh, money and effort and energy in, this, in the frame of this project is going into develop the methodologies, the programs, for example, how to work together with the tenants, what kind of mentoring programs can we provide for them. So I think a lot of knowledge we will develop, what can be shared afterwards, and if a municipality, let's say, in Budapest together with the Budapest munici municipality because we have this two layered um, structure in Budapest or if there is a national program to give some small support then together with the with the with the money or financial possibilities of the certain municipality this project can be 
uh, repeated. So I think what is very important, then we would like to change a bit the view of social housing in Hungary and Budapest, because this is something, you know, uh, politicians and leaders think that this is only for, you know, people who are, you know, who don't work or who don't have income or who don't do anything, but it's, it's not the case, as we heard, you know, uh, there is a housing crisis, so even people with income are struggling uh, to have a decent uh, apartment or housing. And I think it's a very important thing to to say that okay, uh, leasing uh, a rent rent uh, good quality apartments is a is a more and more important uh, duty of municipalities and also of national governance as well. Thank you much, Rebecca. I think it's also a very important message for the whole discussion that uh, public authorities can and have to take an, a more important role in providing affordable housing. Um, another important aspect of your project, Rebecca, is uh, also sustainability. And uh, we have a question from Christian Dar, who, uh, by the way, works in a, in a foundation to move properties out of speculation. Uh, that who would like to know a little bit more about how do you work with the building waste and also building materials? Uh, can you could you introduce a process, for example, to recycle some of these materials later? Is it part of a larger process in the neighborhood? Uh, well. Uh... The, the architects were uh, thinking and designing the building in a way that uh, we have several material which is recyclable. So this is what I mentioned that uh, it's a very unique thing that we will use a lot of wood in the structure of the building and uh, which is really not common in Hungary at all, but we did it because of this uh, recyclableness. Uh, but, uh, at the moment, there is no building uh, on, on the area, so there is nothing what we can recycle um, on, on the spot. Uh, but when we calculated the almost uh, nearly net zero energy status, uh, then the architects calculated also the, the material flow. Uh, we can provide number by email if, uh, if someone is interested. Thank you very much. So there is a way to integrate co cooperative housing, co housing into also more sustainable flows of materials. Yes, and energy. absolutely. This is very important. And I would have one last question to you before moving to Dalinka is about um, again diversity and the selection of, of tenants. How did you, you said you don't have the talent, tenants yet, you have a focus group. Uh, what is the process of selecting the tenants? Yes, uh, the tenant selection will take place probably the next year in the spring, uh, approximately five or six months before the house uh, is being built. It's a special thing because, you know, usually people who are really in need of housing, uh, it's, they, they wouldn't be very happy if I tell them that, okay, you will have a solution in two years or three years because maybe their status will change in the meantime. So that's why we couldn't select the tenants yet. But we are working on the selection criteria system, which will be a kind of uh, scores, points we will give to the, to the people who are applying for being tenants. And we will try to, to measure their social status, how much they are really in need of housing. Uh, they already have a system in Zubla municipality, which, uh, which is a bit similar. And uh, this, this was the basis and we were working on it more to focus uh, on, this, on this project. Um, and it will be made public, of course, also the, the selection criteria system. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And I have one overall question to Darinka. You spoke about a lot of things. Uh, but especially two aspects of the questions uh, I found very important when you talked about the diversification of types of co-housing and there's also a growing number of co-housing projects across Europe and the world. Uh, Joanna Daskalopoulou was asking if uh, this could correlate with an aging population. It may be the fact that in Europe we have an aging population. Will it lead to more co-housing projects potentially? And also I would come back to Liat's uh, remark that Laura was mentioning that uh, we can see that in this crisis situation, uh, co-housing projects are dealing better with probably with solidarity aspects. Uh, uh, would this be another drive to, you know, help uh, increasing the number of co-housing projects, helping uh, different countries and cities to build new co-housing projects? And what can we do on the European scale for this? 
Thanks for your interesting questions, uh, Levent. Indeed, well, with regards to the aging issue, uh, aging demographic change, as I said, is actually one of the main drivers of the new waves of uh, collaborative housing. Um, and we do see that in many countries, well, the, there are preliminary figures that show that there is an increase in this type of projects. And also we have countries like Denmark uh, that have recently started uh, government uh, initiatives to uh, do more research into the possibilities of these models uh, to to be a better solution for elderly people. And they're putting money and effort into developing uh, actually more uh, collaborative housing projects. So yes, I think definitely uh, senior population. But here we have to distinguish also their senior only uh, projects and they're also the multi-generational projects. And in both there are uh, very interesting approaches to how to deal with this uh, this this group. So I, I think that that diversity is is increasing at the moment. And then uh, your second uh, remark was about the cry. Uh, sorry, can you? Yeah, the resilience to the crisis. This, yes, uh, yes, that's also a very interesting topic. And of course, we've been very actively exchanging with the groups uh, and uh, with whom we we work in our uh, collab uh, research group and. Uh, groups of people and, and, and we see a lot of creativity. I, I think it would be an interesting uh, hypothesis to test in a way to see, well, these people, people who engage in these type of projects are per se people who tend to show more solidarity and, and, uh, and care for others. Uh, so uh, it is, I suppose, uh, reasonable to expect that in, in a period of crisis, they would tend to uh, try and come up with uh, solutions to, on how to deal with this uh, uh, lockdown and help each other, continue to help each other despite the, the issue of proximity, right? So I think this is a, a very interesting question that we should explore definitely uh, in the crisis and post-crisis. Thank well, you very much, Dorinka. I think, yeah, I would give it over to Laura. I think this is a message also that we hopefully can build on in the future. And, you know, we have a lot of organizations together with us, uh, Urbex, UIA, who can actually help in different steps to get uh, a stronger uh, co-housing ecosystem across Europe. Sorry, Laura, uh, I will thank you. give it over to you. Yeah, I, thank you very much. Um, in this, uh, I, I think it's very challenging, honestly. And, uh, and you know, I'm uh, very, doubtful how things are going to go with the virus whether there is more or less solidarity whether there is more like egoism because we are all feared to get sick or, or, or not so I, i'm just i think we are all listening and trying to understand what is happening and um and we really need to stick with uh yeah important uh, ideas and discussions ongoing and learning from what is actually happening because we don't really know but anyway, so long discussion. I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting hungry. It's time for uh, every, I think for our bodies to uh, to get new sugar. Uh, but uh, we have the Dulcis in fundo of our discussion, and it's Michalis Gubit, uh, who has been uh, listening in silence uh, for all the time for all this uh, conversation. And Michalis is working in the housing Europe, um, as I was saying before, uh, the housing. Uh, the umbrella organization uh, for housing providers and housing Europe has been uh, very, very active and obviously in um, uh, lobbying in, uh, in the urban agenda in collaborating with other international organizations I mentioned before, the IUT, but also PEANSA and, and so on. So it would be really, really interesting to have your final comments on what is the position of uh, housing Europe and also what is the position of the commission well, it doesn't have a, a clear and direct mandate on housing, but it's actually influencing very much also the, the housing situation in Europe. So thanks, Michalis. And, and then uh, we will greet you for the final, uh, with the final appointment information. Thanks. We don't hear you. I don't hear you. Mm. I personally don't hear. I don't know if everyone else is uh, hearing Michalis. No, apparently no sound. 
Maybe, Michalis, you can take away your microphone and try with the normal computer mic. If Hear me now? Yes, great, fantastic, thanks. Okay. It says that I'm muted by the host, though. Ah, okay, so it was not the, yeah. But is it okay now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Okay, yeah. okay. I get conflicting messages from Zoom, but anyway. It's part of the deal, I guess, of home office and so on. But anyway, uh, I want to start by just sharing a few words about what is Housing Europe, although you briefly explained that Housing Europe is the European Federation of Public Cooperatives and Social Housing. And it has been established uh, 31 years ago as a network of uh, national and regional federations that gather more or less 43,000 public, social and cooperative housing providers in 24 countries. And all these organizations all together manage around 25 million homes. That's more or less 10% uh, of uh, Europe's total housing stock. To the point now, I will divide this very short intervention in uh, three parts. Uh, first of all, I would like to share with you how the relationship between the Housing Europe membership and collaborative housing uh, looks like. Uh, in particular, I think uh, we have to, sh to share that our cooperative members uh, share more or less the same uh, borderline, I would say, of the housing spectrum with collaborative housing projects. They share values and usually are actively involved as well in exchange with this type of projects. Some of them even adopt co-productive approaches while developing their own projects, which is central uh, to collaborative housing, as Darinka uh, stressed uh, before. And I would mention very briefly a few examples uh, to make this case. For instance, in Ireland, Cooperative Housing Ireland um, is trying to support new citizens groups that come uh, to them for advice and leadership based on their experience uh, on how to practically uh, develop uh, their own project. For instance, they mentioned uh, lately to us a case of a group of nurses that were trying to, to create their own co-housing uh, project and they came to Cooperative Housing Ireland for help and advice. The same uh, happens in Italy with cooperatives there that are trying to promote the cooperative model uh, to this new uh, emerging uh, solution, as is the case also in Flanders, in Belgium, uh, with the Association of Flemish uh, Social Housing Companies, BBH. They are uh, helping uh, setting up uh, cooperatives being developed at the moment. Uh, it's a very active region, 18 uh, projects uh, that could be uh, categorized under collaborative housing are being developed at the moment. And as we've been uh, hearing from BVH, both sides are learning a lot uh, from this exchange. At the same time, we have cooperative members in Sweden, for instance, like Riksbygden, uh, where they uh, produce tailored solutions uh, based on the new needs. For instance, they, uh, Riksbygden in Göteborg, they are developing a co-productive way again, a cooperative housing project uh, targeting only uh, well, other in particular, young people, young working adults that, uh, despite having a stable job, they cannot afford uh, decent housing solutions. So, Rick Spigen is developing a tailored cooperative housing concept, taking um, elements from the collaborative approach. And then a really good case, I think, very representative of this exchange. Uh, I mentioned that I had also presented briefly in Porto at the Cities Forum, in the first uh, meeting we had, is uh, Von Bedrive from Eindhoven and their project Space S. Uh, Co-creation there is the, at the core of the belief. They produced 400 homes. Uh, for regular and student uh, housing projects, but they do not choose their tenants, but they, the, re the residents actually choose uh, the, this particular project. They use multiple tools from social media to online surveys, and um, actually the own organization highlights that uh, the DNA of Space S is the interface between green and urban uh, together and self flexibility and uh, framework. So indeed, there is a, a lot of room for uh, cooperation between more established uh, organizations uh, like the housing cooperatives and the collaborative uh, housing projects. Housing Europe itself, uh, the team here in Brussels, has also engaged in a closer collaboration with uh, initiatives like, for instance, uh, 
community land trust process that was represented today by Arthur, but also Urbanmon. These two organizations have uh, joined uh, our network uh, last year, so they are part of uh, the housing group family. The second point I would like to make is this link between the EU and the right to housing, as you uh, mentioned, uh, Laura. I think over the last decade, uh, in particular after 2016, when the Pact of Amsterdam uh, was implemented in the European agenda, and in particular the housing partnership, especially since we have Michaela Tower with us, I think that housing has been getting higher and higher on the EU agenda. That's uh, quite safe to say. And there has been a shift away from this. Um, you know, statement that we kept hearing here in Brussels that the EU has no competence in housing. Um, I think that through, through this regular exchange, especially through the urban agenda, we managed to establish this understanding that the EU may not have the competence but has clear influence in the ways in which the right to housing is or is not actually implemented and guaranteed um, in the member states. So uh, this couldn't have been different as well now, as uh, Europe has been confronted, uh, not just with this coronavirus housing crisis, but this long-standing housing crisis uh, that Berinka uh, presented. Uh, this pandemic, though, has uh, make it, made it clear even to the ones that had chosen to pretend a uh, housing crisis does not exist um, in Europe. I think we should really highlight the potential of the uh, European Pillar of Social Rights. This is the first time that in an official text of the EU adopted by all member states, non binding document, though, access to social housing is recognized uh, as one of the principles and rights uh, essential for fair and well functioning labor markets and the welfare systems in, in Europe. And I think this we could say that reflects uh, a change in the political approach. And maybe it creates the necessary momentum uh, to put forward concrete implementation measures because that's now the major challenge uh, for the pillar in the coming years. Right now the, the European Parliament is putting together an initiative report. Uh, it's currently compiled by uh, rapporteur Kim van Spalenberg, uh, with the Greens uh, on the need for decent and affordable housing for all. I think this particular report uh, pretty much is expected uh, to describe uh, Europe's housing crisis, uh, again in a non-binding but institutional document, and also to suggest ways in which uh, the EU can help address uh, the crisis, uh, especially given the ambition of the, the ambition level of the EU and the renovation wave that were presented by the Commission I recently. Uh, we've heard about the transparent act publicly recalling also in a podcast we had with her this week that the, this needs to tackle the housing crisis and the climate crisis uh, given the mobilization uh, of the commission and then the, the third point um, for the eu uh, level of uh, let's say the EU level mobilization when it comes to right of housing is of course funding i think there is increased awareness uh, within the minds even of the macro economies that the change in direction of housing is needed and that funding will, will be directed uh, to housing anyway via investing you the uh, esf uh, via the rbf and of course through the mb the investment bank but what is missing uh, we think at housing europe is a clear recognition that there's no shortage in investment in housing per se but there is a shortage in investment in housing providers that actually reinvest the money that is given to them, housing providers that put people and not profit uh, at the center of their work and uh, providers that generate wealth uh, for their communities. Speaking just, I think, about affordable uh, housing is uh, tricky or can be tricky because this is a term open to multiple definitions and understood much, much differently uh, by various stakeholders. Um, in the housing market. I think the coronavirus uh, crisis threatens to become, if it's not certain, that it will become a major housing crisis too. Uh, in the case we do not tackle not only its uh, short-term but also its long-term consequences, once of course we uh, have adequate emergency responses like the rent free or the freeze of home foreclosures and so on. We see measures taken all over Europe these days. Um, this means that more and more people, I think, uh, will be looking for these and affordable housing solutions in the near distant future. And so it's an urgent need uh, to, to second the point that was made earlier to, to put the brakes on financialization of housing. Uh, 
um, speculative investment in real estate will continue, but um, because this is considered a sort of safe, I would say, option for investors. But there's no time to let just the market do the work. And we absolutely need uh, to boost supply of public, cooperative, and social housing, both through uh, construction and renovation, but also even through additions, let's say, to the segment. Um, of the market uh, from certain markets. Michelle, is, I'm, I'm, I'm having also information from people through other co networks that they don't hear you well. And I, I, I can wrap up a little bit of what you have been saying. Uh, say, for instance, you mentioned the, the social pillar of rights uh, and you mentioned also the funding of your DF. Uh, you mentioned the report which is coming up. So I think maybe it would be useful also for uh, for the people that are part of uh, the of this group to share this information. Maybe if you you can share it afterwards, because unfortunately, it, it seems the your voice is not was not hundred percent clear. So it, maybe you can uh, send this link, and obviously we we should look at the work that um, Housing Europe is doing in, in this regard. They also produce a, a very interesting um, study on uh, European funding for housing. And um, if you um, if if you want to close up with a short message, because uh, because it's really really hard to follow, maybe just yeah. very. I I really I really, I really don't I really don't know what's the problem because before we did the test and everything was working, but anyway, I think that the you. I think that the EU um, can help fix the housing crisis. That's the final message. Mm -hmm. And I think we can highlight three points uh, that we can turn the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Social Pillar into a lens for all EU policies, make use of the action plan that the housing partnership uh, of the European agenda has produced and keep this uh, cross-sectoral exchange alive. And of course, double, if possible, the EIB investment in, uh, in housing of social, public, cooperative or community land. Uh, form. And of course, keep this kind of exchange alive that started in Porto and continues today, hopefully with no other technical issues. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Michalis, and thank you for, for your passion in, in the last um, uh, point. Um, okay, uh, thank you. A big, a very a sincere thanks to all the participants that uh, joined us and to all the speakers that took their time to prepare and to do rehearsal with us and to join us today. Uh, thank you a lot to uh, everyone in the team that supported the creation of the platform. I think that we need to further this type of uh, discussions, but we also have uh, other tools we plan to write reports about this, but also to do podcast interviews to external speakers, that people that we cannot have here um, and also to do sort of video stories of what is happening at city level and all of this would be combined and put together in the knowledge hub of Corpact and UIA. I would like to announce the next two uh, encounters that have been already pre-planned. So the next one is going to be in June, in the 26th of June uh, and it will be dedicated uh, No One Left Behind. So mostly focusing on homelessness and migration um, and gender policies. There will be the third one, which is dedicated to uh, fair finance. It's the, now we fixed the date for the 6th of November and we will focus on municipal strategies uh, protecting housing and land from speculation. And so far, I think it, that's all from us. And I hope that we, we have a lot of uh, information to sh continue sharing and, uh, and I hope to have you on board for the next time. Thank you very much.